where does this all start? You know, you're a kid from Knoxville. You grew right. up in East Knoxville. Um, how do you get to the point where you are today, where you have such a, a brand that people love and, and, and has a lot of respect? Well, like you said, I grew up just actually a few blocks from here uh, in East Knoxville and my great grandparents and a lot of people still think I'm Mark Nelson. My name is Marcus Hall. My great grandfather was C.A. Nelson. And so that's where the Mark Nelson comes from. My mother calls me Mark. Uh, and my grandfather instilled in me and my brothers, no matter who you are, the janitor or the mayor, you always want to leave the house looking like somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, I took that to heart. And even through middle school and, and elementary and, and high school, I made it my part to, you know, kind of dress the part. And I enjoyed dressing and people complimenting me. Uh, and when I graduated, uh, I started cutting hair because I enjoyed, again, giving what I, my, I feel like was a talent of mine and sharing that with others. And so from there, I uh, started the brand Mark Nelson Denim. So you were always like best dressed kid. I was. I got best dressed in high school. Yes, I did. <laughs> so that was that was fun for me. That was I, that was my my statement in school. I had to get best dressed. I, I you better vote for me best dressed. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was the deal. Uh, my mother taught me to sew. Uh, and really? So, yeah, she did. My mom taught me to sew. Did your mother it's teach a you beautiful to sew? art. Yes, it is. It's great. I, I, the first thing we sewed was a dashiki. Yes. So I wore that dashiki to school, and people were like, "What are you wearing?" Like that was like, "What is going on here in Knoxville?" But it, yeah, I remember that like it was yesterday. So I do appreciate my mother for giving me that, uh, sharing that talent with me. And I took tailoring at Austin East. Mr. Scott uh, actually told me how, or taught me how to sew formally and uh, so again there used to be a Levi's plant was just in your backyard here that was there for decades and and so that had a huge impression on me and most of the uh, people in the East Knoxville community that was a great job uh, so if your mother or father or anyone in your family worked at the Levi's plant they got benefits and bought a new car a house and it afforded them to make a better life for their children uh, and so I took tailoring to hopefully work at that Levi's plant, mm -hmm. but they started phasing out and, uh, and shutting down then. So I had to put it on pause for a little while, but then came back, you know, about 13, 14 years later and started Mark Nelson Denim. Did, did you take to um, tailoring and sewing? Was it easy for you to take to it? It was, at, because my mother taught me to sew, it was. It was easy. It, things with shapes work are easy for me. Like I can look at something and, and that's just something, I guess it was maybe my mother, but I've always been, even when I did hair or cut hair, I could look at a shape of something, imagine it, and then kind of cut it out and put it together. So now take me to what planted the seed for you to actually say, you know what, I can do this. I think I'd like a business of my own. Uh, you know, I, it just was a dream. For years and years, uh, I'm a you know entrepreneur from the from the heart. So I had a paper out, and I, I enjoyed working by my, for myself. Or even at the salon, you know, you make your own money, your own schedule. And so I just kept dreaming about. I want to start this line, and initially it was just a dream. And then you know, I, I moved out to Los Angeles, worked at a cut and sew facility for a little bit, just to kind of test the waters, got some experience. And then uh, came back to Knoxville and, and started the Mark Nelson Denim. Now, what did you start with first? What was your fashion line? Uh, so the first line was, it, it, I tell people this story, it was initially supposed to be a men and women's line. And it was called Barely Denim. Because when I was working in LA, stretch denim, everyone didn't have it yet. So you, I was like, oh God, this doesn't even feel like denim. So I was like, oh, Barely Denim, it'd be a great line for a men and a women's line, basically, is what I was kind of thinking of, Barely Denim. and then. Um, if I could expand that to barely uh, grown kids line, you know what I mean? Yes. I could keep going with that. And uh, my graphic designer and the person that uh, I was working with to help me grow the line, we were having a little cocktail and, and they were laughing. And I was like, what are you laughing at? I was like, because I decided to make the line just a, clearly a men's line. And it was like, do you think Barely Denim is a good name for a men's line? I was like, we've been working on this four months and now you're just after <laughs> we've like trademarked it. And, and done all this stuff, so I had to go back to the drawing board. And uh, my first full name is George Marcus Hall, so I was like, oh, George Jeans or George Denim, and that was taken. And and uh, and then I finally was like, you know, I'm going to pay homage to my my great grandfather. And then my mother calls me Mark, and and that's where the Mark Nelson came from. My goodness, what is it like going into your shop now on Depot Street, knowing that that's that's you? You know what? It's a great feeling because as you come in. Uh, there's an old picture of my great-grandfather, C.A., 
uh, as you come in the door. And so he's one of the first things you see. And we are literally three blocks from where him and my great grandma is. Well, I call him Mama and Papa. And uh, the building's three blocks from where uh, I grew up at. So when I moved back from LA, some friends of mine were already in the basement printing t-shirts and they told me about the spot. It was 3,000 square foot of space for $500 a month. And I was in LA and my parking space was more than that. Right. So, <laughs> so um, I came uh, back, looked at the space and looked, saw the location and I was in. It was a horrible building at the time. Uh, I cleared the space out. There was uh, old trucks and motors and they had a little bit of everything in there. Uh, so we cleaned it out and we were at the time just doing wholesaling and e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, and people just started to uh, show up, um, knocking on the door and say, hey, can we buy jeans here instead of buying them online? And I was like, whoa. And so we built out a little showroom. And it's funny, uh, one of your uh, staff members, one of the guys that's filming us used to be a little iffy. Did you, do yeah, you, did know. you know that? I know, I so know. So we used to do First Fridays, and 10, 11 years ago, no one was doing First Fridays. So we'd have 300 people there, a stage. He performed, like, First Fridays were bananas. Like, it was crazy. And the goal <laughs> was to get people to buy stuff, but it was so crowded. No one wanted to try clothes on uh, during that time. You know what I mean? Yes, like, they were like, yes. and so they'd come back. And so we kind of built the name, and every month or every other month, we'd have a First Friday. And uh, eventually, I was able to buy the building. And uh, we moved to the front part of it. And so to the answer to your question is, uh, it's, uh, we, we laid it out. It's very, um, it's a man cave. Yes. It's very cozy, comfortable, warm. What I found was men like, they don't like bright lights and here I am and trying on clothes and okay. like they're on the, the runway. They want to be cozy, comfortable, a little darker. Almost like a cigar room. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly what that is, exactly. And so maybe have, you know, a, a, a little bourbon or something just to kind of calm their nerves. And, and then we, we make uh, relationships. We build relationships at Mark Nelson Denham. So our business model is no longer wholesale. We don't even wholesale to department stores or boutiques. It's more personal relationships. And we get, you know, uh, more, uh, more money or better bang for our buck. So how did you go from denim to suits? I mean, because now you're like the who's here. When you look on your social media and you see all the different people um, that have come through to, to get a suit from you, you've got some big names. Well, you know, it's uh, interesting. So before, as I said, our business models, we were wholesaling. And um, when we were wholesaling, initially starting, we go to trade shows. And trade shows were really expensive. Oh. Uh, 15 grand at the minimum, and that's a 10 by 10, yeah. And you've got New York, and you've got Las Vegas, and then you've got Chicago, and then you've got the smaller shows that are not as expensive, but constantly on the road. Uh, and then, I, I, we haven't talked about it yet, but when I got in trouble for the uh, tax evasion and the gambling deal, I, I had to recreate myself. I could no longer afford that, because when you wholesale, you've got to buy the fabric, make the product, and then you ship it in a lot of big stores, big box stores, they want terms. So you may not get paid for six months. Oh, wow. So you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars out there that you're like, and you got staff that you gotta pay and keep the, I couldn't do that anymore. So when I got home from prison, I had to figure out what do I do now? And so my idea was direct to consumer. We had m merchandise or inventory in the shop. And so I decided I've got three months, it was about October when I got home, and if I could do, make $45,000 over this course of the th uh, three months, then I would keep the shop open, uh, and I did. Uh, I was so shocked and overwhelmed how when I got home, the city of Knoxville supported me. And I was literally just cold calling people and go, hey, this is Mark from Mark Nelson Dillon. Uh, I'd love for you to stop by the shop, you know, I'm home, and you know, they wanted to hear how I was doing. And, and so, like you said, Randy Boyd's and and Kevin Clayton's and Terry Turner's and, and staples of the community started coming in. And then what I also found was uh, I was making a lot of jeans and custom things for football players and they were going like, man, I need a blazer, you know? And so I was like, well, why, don't, why am I sending these people to somewhere else to get a blazer made? Why aren't I doing it? And so I would, that was in my comfort zone at the time. And that's been about six years or so. Uh, and then I realized uh, with some tutoring and uh, from a, some major uh, lines that uh, we now carry about measuring and, and we made a lot of mistakes but now that's the biggest part of our business. We make more margin and, and we do more um, on the uh, revenue side of the custom blazers.
Wow. Let, let's go back since you, you brought it up. Okay. Um, let's say, you know, um, take us back to um, you, when you were pulled over and you found out I'm in trouble. Oh, wow. There you go. Uh, it was, yeah, it was like I was out of, uh, you know, looking at myself. You, you got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, June 9th. Okay. Uh, and so I was actually on my way to uh, talk to a, 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 a huge business about uh, outfitting their uh, employees and I got pulled over uh, and I thought it was police, you know, or asking a black man. I was driving a Porsche at the time and uh, and then boom, you know, all these cars, black unmarked cars showed up and I was like, is this the time? Uh, and because I had been running a, an illegal gambler operation for several years and I just thought it was, you know, I, it, it was just I quit one day and, you know, nothing would ever happen. Mm -hmm. But come to find out, they had been investigating me for two years and uh, ended up having to spend 14 months in federal prison uh, by the grace of God because they sentenced me to 36 months. And the judge, who's no longer with us, actually, um, recommended I go into a program called RDAP, which allowed me to get uh, 12 months cut off my sentence and to get home and spend six months in a halfway house. So that ended up being what I thought was the end of my world, and, and I, you know, I just I'd not I'd be able to, you know, recover from that being a blessing. What, okay, so you were, they call it running numbers. Yep. Okay, what, what were you doing? So basically, it's before the lottery and the Powerball was a thing, uh, especially in the black community, there's a, a deal called the numbers, and you base it off of the lottery. Uh, we based ours off the Illinois lottery, which pulled a midday and a lot, a nighttime, a number, and they've got a three digit and a four digit, and we basically, you know, we had people turn their numbers in and if they hit, we paid them just like the lottery. And if they lose, we kept the money. Did you ever think you were get caught? I know I, you said- I did you know. I, I, you know, there was a point we've had some scares and then, you know, it's been around so long. You know what I mean? The number business has been around before I was born and right. years and years. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you are black, most blacks, you, and, you know, know about the number business, especially in the inner city. Uh, but no, I didn't. I thought, you know, I would eventually quit and move on. And that's why, you know, I started Mark Nelson Dinner to kind of transition out. But when they caught me, that was, I, I, there was a monkey on my back. Like for about a year, I could feel like, you know how you feel like you something's mean? not right. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was tired. Uh, in the number business, there was always something, you know, some drama. Somebody's trying to rob you because they know they got cash. Uh, so we were living. It was dangerous. It wasn't a. It wasn't an easy breezy at all. It was. It was a. It was a headache. So yeah, house broken into, store broken into. So it was. It was a mess. And it was amazing looking back now how, I made that normal. Do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't normal at all. Normal at all. But we. It was like oh, that's just oh, we're it's so you know it's no big deal. Whatever the case may be. When in actuality, it was. It was a crazy life. And I'm so I'm glad that. I put that in my past and, and moved on, yeah. When I first heard the news about, well, obviously the news, I am the news. So <laughs> when, when I remember reporting on you, um, you know, I think the part that was shocking was what I saw right on. was this yeah. successful yeah. entrepreneur, yeah. you know, here it is, you've made um, this business that, and you're not selling like cheap jeans, like right your on. stuff is like custom. and. Right on. Um, and so the juxtaposition of the two personalities, Amen. like, hey, he's running numbers, but he's got, yeah, yeah. you know, why would you even do that? Because your business seems so successful. So at the time when I started my business and in the fashion industry, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of money and a lot of work. There's a lot of competition out there. Uh, and so starting the business, uh, just getting that extra capital to start the business was what it did. But okay. in, in hindsight, I could have quit years. Ago. You know, I, way before I got in trouble, my business was at a point where it was making money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I was just addicted to that cash and that free, you know, that, that money, that grind, that lifestyle of gambling and being on edge. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, you know, and when I went to prison and when I first got there, my thought was when I get home, I'm gonna, you know, be smarter about my little deal and go back to making money and gambling or whatever the case would be. And literally a week of being in prison, I tore my Achilles heel. And I and I tell my friends this, yeah, I was in prison and I tore my Achilles heel. So no, not knowing anybody and in a prison and laid up and like, oh my God. And that's when me and God had our argument. And he told me, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Like, you know, like let's let's. You didn't need to do that. You can do this. 
and be successful without but doing out without doing illegal uh, things. And so um, when I came home uh, through that RDAP program, which uh, was one of the toughest things I had to do in my life, because mentally it, they put you. It, I mean, because if you didn't get through the program, I would have had to spend that 36 months in prison, right. which would you know that's a that's. You know, I just had a four month year old. My daughter was four months old when I self surrendered. So, you know, that was stressful for me. And I, that was the biggest um, hurdle of, you know, that hurt. What makes uh, the program hard? Uh, well, you have to hold each other accountable. Okay. So, and, and there's rules, and, and then you go to a meeting several times a day. And when I say hold each other accountable, like no cursing or, you know, like just being uh, a good person, you know, uh, talking, speaking negatively about not going. You had to get a job and there were jobs that you had to perform. Did you go to being on time? Like the little bitty minute things um, we held each other accountable for. And so at any time during the program, it's a 10 month program, you could be kicked out. So that's what it's like being on survival. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, yeah. and then, you know, now you've got that year that you've got to serve. And so you've got to, and the further along in the program you get, the more responsibilities you have and you have uh, to mentor uh, people. So then you have to be accountable for others. And if they're not on point, then that could also cause you to be uh, put out the program. So uh, it, that was stressful. So, uh, and, but I made it through and I got home. Uh, and it's just uh, for being accountable was, is what that program taught me uh, and not blaming and pointing a finger about things that happen in your life, which we all want to do and tend to do sometimes. Absolutely. Like you're speeding and you get a ticket because you're late for work right. and you're mad at the police office for getting your ticket. Right. But had you left on time, you wouldn't have had to speed. You know what I mean? Like right. little things like that, um, you know, you kind of what so which helped me to get back home and get on the right track. And so uh, what was a what was, I thought again, was a, a horrific and horrible situation, uh, give, gave me the opportunity to start over with the right mindset and, and, and reaffirm my um, Christian base and my relationship with God. Like, you know, because for so, I was right, my mom was a preacher. So I was raised in church and I was always fighting with that, you know, I'm on this side, the dark side, of the negative side, doing something wrong. So I was like, I can't go to church because I wouldn't be able to really be like this. I would be lying right. uh, because I was living that double life. And so, yeah, so it's allowed me and we, it, as, we all make mistakes and we're as human beings, uh, we can't even as Christians, we're not perfect. So, um, so yeah, so, so things have changed. You finish the program, you're, you, that part is behind you. How do you regroup and say, I'm not going to quit this business. I can keep it going. Take me to the next step in Mark Nelson Denim. I, you know what? Um, when I got home, I really thought I was going to close the business. I was tired. <laughs> I mean, I was. I was not even the same person. Like, that program had, or, and being in prison and being embarrassed and, you know, you right. lied to all these people. So I just was like, I'll just get a delivery job. I was like, I'll do anything. I just want to just live my life and spend some time with my, my children. And, uh, uh, and slowly but surely, like I said, uh, Kim Milligan, she was working with me at the time and she kept the business open. And I remember calling her and telling her to shut it down. And so I, I love her like family. She, she said, no, she kept the business open. Wow. And, uh, again, we did that in that three months. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but at the time it was a lot of money for me because I couldn't afford to do inventory or make new, you know, I just, you know, I just, I was blessed and fortunate. And again, I had to support and slowly but surely it allowed me to get my feet under me and then to think, oh man, this worked. So instead of wholesaling, I could take the little money I have, buy new inventory and continue the way I'm doing, which is, you know, uh, selling directly to the consumer. Uh, and so my business model now is, I focus on three to 500 guys and they spend three to five grand or more a month. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was year. like, wait, what? That's <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, that's like, uh, that's sorry, a that's year. That was like, yeah, so they, that's like, I'm sorry, a year annually. That's, that's um, amazing. Yeah, so annually. And, you know, it's, uh, we're small. I've got roughly four employees. And, uh, you know, that's what we do. Uh, we just recently opened a store in Florida, too, which is a, a great story in itself. So, um, yeah, yeah. What's your what's your vision? Uh, you know, you've expanded. Um, your business is, is doing well. What, what, what's next? You know, 
uh, we've got uh, this subscription service, Emin Society. I'd like to grow that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to maybe open another few brick and mortars because it's a thing of the past um, uh, in some major cities, maybe Nashville. Um, and um, yeah, I just keep, if we could just keep this going, I would be happy. Before I wanted to take over the world and be the biggest brand and da 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 da. And right now, uh, you know, take care of my kids and, 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 you know, build a good life for them. I like Knoxville. Uh, our community is headed in a great direction. The baseball stadium is going to be built here in, a, you know, three to four years or so. Uh, and, you know, keep making Knoxville a cool place and, and you know, surviving. Uh, yes. Surviving. <laughs> Do you ever wonder, um, you know, with you've got this business where you've taken fashion and tailored it um, specifically to men. What young kids um, that may look at you and go, I want to get into the fashion industry. You know, you got kids right in East Knoxville. You got it. I, you know, I got, I got a t-shirt business, all those little hustles yeah. that kids come yeah. up with. And they can see, you know, or if you just apply yourself, you can have your own business. I know. I, as a matter of fact, I've got a young man from the University of Tennessee. He's actually from Memphis that has a little business in. Uh, I love that. Mentoring it would be great. It's tough. I, in fact, you know, the fashion industry is tough. There's a lot of competition, but any, any advice or any way I could help someone kind of stay in uh, something they love and keep them on the right path, I, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy working with kids. I do. You're, you're good with connections. So if you look at your Facebook page or just keep up with you, you've, you've got some connections all across town, the people that come by your store, the different celebrities. Uh, how do you foster those relationships with um, the different who's who here in Knoxville? You know, uh, it's interesting. I'm, I, I, I keep our business private. I don't constantly nag them about, you know, coming into the store. But I think what I found, and especially with men, men don't like to shop. Yes. Do you know what I mean? True. Like they, they're like men. Like, can you just take her? My, my husband does like, the shop. Like, I know. Like, it's like Jenny, please. So uh, <laughs> I've got a relationship with them, and they trust me. Uh, and you know, I, I, I'm just very fortunate. I, again, I, I do. Uh, like I said, these guys hate the shop, and they call me and go. They literally text me, "Can I wear this?" You know what I mean? Like they put little outfits together and stuff. And or I go, "Oh God, no! Please don't you put that out and put this with it or whatever." So uh, we've built again a relationship. They trust me that uh, I'll, I'll keep them looking good and not take them too far out there. And, and some of the guys, you know, like these NI, the NIL thing is a big deal now. So these younger guys like to go to the far side. So we do, we just make it easy for them. Okay, so let's have a little fun. What's your style? What is my style? What's your style? How you know would you what? describe it? Oh God, I would describe my style as <sighs> country blue collar couture. I know that's like, see, I'm wearing these jeans and they're holy and <laughs> I'm comfortable. And then I put a little, you know, flair to it. And but I'm comfortable like that's what I like to be comfortable. But I like <laughs> a little splash. And I say, and I'm country. I am a southern boy from the heart. Like I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. And and if I wasn't having this interview, you get me mad. I'll have a lot of twain. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, I just, I, I like to be comfortable. And, and my staples are, I started with denim. So that's where I get the, you know, country, comfortable, but then adding a blazer and a little pop to it, a flair to it would be what I call it. So there you go. We may need to, you know, kind of tidy that up a little no, bit. No, I like that. I like it just the way you said it. Okay, <laughs> tell me, give me your top three men that you've clothed. Oh, wow. Uh, we've made jeans for Peyton Manning. Uh, I love Chris Blue. I've done mm -hmm. a, a photo shoot with Chris Blue, and uh, we did uh, a deal with uh, Willie uh, from the uh, American Idol, and that That's was right. like a challenge. And but we became friends, and uh, and he, I I've never seen so someone so happy to be like, wow, I'm wearing some cool clothes because he's a big guy, right? And he's had to settle. Uh, and so uh, me wearing, making stuff that he was like, I never thought I'd be able to wear stuff like this. Like, yeah, and I appreciate you so much. And so it was life changing for him to be able to like. So that was that was that was uh, a highlight of my life because I saw that uh, happen. And I've had several guys spend drop thousands of dollars on things. But my, one of my, my one of the highlights of my life was being able to work with him. Does this bring you joy? I love it. That's why I do it. I, I mean, and, and before, uh, you know, I think it, I was so caught up in the I want to be this brand 
And now it's happening organically because I'm doing what I love. I love clothing people. I love making people smile because they go, oh, man, I love this. You know what I mean? And, and talking about fashion and, and teaching people, you know, how to be the best them through just, you know, clothing. It's, it's, that's important. You talked about um, the location on Depot Street. You touched on Florida. Tell us a little bit more about the shop in Florida, where it's located. So Florida, another great story. Lakeland. Again, Lakeland, Florida. And the reason people, why are you in Lakeland? Uh, I would literally have been in a halfway house about four months and was walking through my shop to actually my, see my little girl. And it was sheer coincidence because I was working somewhere else and the phone rang. And I answered the phone and I go, Mark Nelson Denham. And uh, this guy goes, hey, I live in Florida. Um, could I buy your jeans and, uh, you know, directly from the store? And I go, of course you can. And so um, he uh, bought four pair of jeans. We shipped it to him and he uh, hung up the phone and he says, go Vols. And I go, oh, you're a Vols fan. All right. So I, I had no idea who this dude was. Shipped the jeans, put a UT shirt in the box. He calls, I love the jeans. Uh, thank you for the T-shirt. Me and my family are going to Kentucky Derby in a couple months. Can we stop by the shop? He told me when, came to the shop. Uh, with his family, two kids, a wife, and spent four thousand okay. dollars. I was like, "Whoa, Thank okay, you. right? Yeah, yeah, Dave, yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate you for coming in here." So he did that a couple times, and then he said, "Man, you got to come to Florida." And at the time, I was on probation, so I had to get permission from our probation officer to go to Florida. Uh, and she actually called him, and he received it, and he goes, "Yes, he's coming. We're doing a trunk show at my house, and da da da." And I still didn't really know who this guy was. Long story short, come to find out, he's, a, he's best friends with the, the founder of the uh, Publix grandson. Oh, okay. So, boom. Yeah, so I'm going to Florida now, and I'm with these guys that, I mean, they're, you know, they're loaded. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're, so they're, they're, yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and so did that for a few months, and then they said, man, you got to open a store here. And so these group of businessmen down in Florida basically put me in a building that, I mean, for free. And set me up there and you know now and i'm you know obviously paying a little rent but i mean it's just it was it's a gift from god like and and they not only do they did they set me up but they also um make it a, a point to call other businessmen in the community to come and support me so they i mean it's like it's crazy it, it, it's it's ridiculous it's like oh my god so it's right. <laughs> All this from a phone call. From a phone call. And an order of jeans and a ball shirt. And if I wouldn't have been there at that time, that would not have happened. Wow. So, so God is good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. There you go. The God is good. Yes. When you reflect on your life from start to finish, do you ever just go, man, I can't believe I'm here. Yeah, daily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes daily yes and i do i have to remind myself because you know from the spirit I, I i can go to the dark side sometimes but yes i have two beautiful wonderful daughters um and a, and a great girlfriend who supports me and um so yeah i'm, I'm fortunate family and and yeah so I, I just keep focused and keep thanking god and and yeah keep on plugging and last why do you stay in knoxville tennessee why does it have your heart I, you know what i'm old <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> I'm tired. I'm just no. I like I said. I, it's interesting. <laughs> I've, I've had this love hate relationship all my life with Knoxville. Really, and I have. It's like when I was younger. I, like I said, I grew up here, and it's a predominantly white city. That's just the reality. And so there was not a lot to do for a young black man. And now, uh, you know, I've moved. I've been to Los Angeles and New York and Atlanta. And, you know, after getting in trouble and, and, and going through what I've gone through, coming back and, you know, the city supporting me, I love the direction that Knoxville's moving towards. Mm -hmm. um, and, you yeah, know, there's a lot of people here that, you know, have kind of pulled me through it, you know what I mean? And so I've got a great base here and, um, and I, and I want to continue that. Yeah, I just, this is home for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is home for me. Thank you so much for talking with Thank me. You for I appreciate me. it. Right. Thank you for telling your story so. Right. Thank you for having me.